But you know, we, uh, we were thinking and looking here at the scripture from Luke 16, and as you could see the title there, a poor man's glass of water. And we've been talking about the uh, significance and what does that mean, and especially as we think about in the kingdom of God. Um, and so uh, here are these words from Luke 16, starting at verse number 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham! Have mercy on me and, and send Lazarus to dip the to tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham says, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received the good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm. Uh, has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so and no one can cross from there to us he said father i beg you to send him to my father's house for i have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not be uh, will not also come into this place of torment abraham replied they have moses and the prophets they should listen to them he said no no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. We certainly live in scary times and we don't have to look too hard to, to understand what that means uh, as we think about uh, everything that's going on all over this world, in this country, in the state, and even in our community over the last few weeks. We know that school violence uh, has communities everywhere uh, just so wound up. We know that as we look at uh, terrorism and, and folks who, who want to do acts of terrorism, uh, it has nations of the world outraged when we hear of these different things happening all over to, to folks. We as individual citizens and as a nation together, uh, we, we feel violated and, and even divided a lot of the times. The peace that we once knew seems to be, to be gone and only a void of uncertainty remains. And we have anger. We have those feelings of, and, and words of vengeance to go against someone. We have the feelings of being offended. And all of that fills that void minute by minute. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I just want someone to point to. <laughs> to say, it's their fault. I'm mad at you. You did this. We want to target a focal point of, of all of our stuff, of all of our hurt, of all of our anger. And the question for the followers of Jesus is this, where does compassion fit into that picture? In this parable of Lazarus and the rich man, Jesus brought that question right to the front of our minds and in our hearts. You see, in Luke's gospel, Jesus told this parable and, and to help us to look at two extremes. It's the extreme of uh, extremely rich and uh, extremely poor. Now, I need you to hear me on this. This parable has nothing to do with how much we have or how much we do not have. Do you understand? <laughs> Just like with Jesus, there's something much deeper than what we have or what we don't have. It's, it's what's in our hearts. Jesus always had a great uh, way of pointing right to the main point of what was happening. The parable asked the, the question of compassion. It, when, when must those, uh, when we're able to and when we, we feel called to and we are led to, when, when do we give to those who may not have as much? Or maybe as we think about, you know, uh, if we have, as the Bible says, two coats, you know, do we give, when do we give that one? Uh, Jesus painted this, this picture in this, uh, in this parable of Lazarus and the rich man in these these major, major differences here. 
On the one hand, the rich man lived uh, like royalty. I mean, it even said he was dressed in purple. Uh, and I uh, noticed this translation had a big word in there, and I decided to keep it because I, my parents were going to be here. I wanted to say a big word for them. He lived sumptuously. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but I'm going to pretend that I am. I mean, he partied. You know, he had a good time. He had everything he wanted. I mean, it, he didn't have a need at all, and if he did, it was filled. Man, what a life, right? What a life. On the other hand, we have this poor guy, Lazarus, who didn't have anything. He, didn't, he would have just loved to sit underneath the table there of the rich, uh, the rich man and just hopefully and praying for a crumb. You know, yesterday uh, I was at the soccer fields after the memorial service and, and uh, Miss Carrie and some others, I heard them, they were talking about food. Uh, and like I said, oh, we've had beef sticks and cereal, and I'm thinking, we're hearing all this stuff, and I'm just like, I just want to be under that table, and hopefully something will fall off. <laughs> you know, we, we feel that sometimes, don't we? <laughs> well, all joking aside, this, this guy was so poor, he would have loved to have got some crumbs. He was so sick and so down that the dogs came to lick at his sores. Of course, so to put it this way, one had it all while the other didn't have a thing. Well, as we know in the scripture, both men died and, and, and one went to, the poor man went to, uh, to be with uh, Abraham in heaven and the rich man, he eternally condemned himself with his hard heart. And with all the things of his former life stripped away, this person realized uh, his problem he realized his dilemma when he looked up and saw Lazarus there laying up, laying on Father Abraham up in heaven. What a beautiful sight that must have been. And it made him want to be there even more. Wait a minute, he thought, wait, what is this? What, why am I here and he's there? He called out for help. Of course, it was too late. But even in his prayer and in the pain that he was feeling from the torment and the agony, the rich man treated Lazarus like he treated him in life. And I never thought about this till not, not too long ago and just looking at this scripture again. Even in death, he still could not see the error of his ways because he still didn't see the significance in Lazarus. Because he wanted Lazarus to come to him to bring him some water. Father Abraham, to help me. <laughs> Just send Lazarus to dip his finger in the water that I might just get a drip. He wanted Lazarus to serve him. Of course, when he was denied his help, the rich man prayed that Lazarus would, would come back to life and go to his family and his brothers and, and uh, you know, be able to tell them to, to change their ways. And, and often thought, you know, if he wasn't noticed already, why would he come back and people say, well, who are you? They wouldn't even notice who he was. But certainly they would listen to someone who has come back to the dead. Certainly they would repent, right, and change their ways. Don't they have the Bible, Abraham asked? Hadn't they read the, the prophets? Haven't they read from Moses? They possessed the word of God, the word in which even the law itself was, was formed and given out of love. If they would not listen to God's word... They will not be convinced even if someone comes back from the dead. This, of course, was not sufficient for this rich man. The parable ended with Abraham's response and that, that question that we keep thinking about uh, of, of, the, of the Christian faith. If you do not believe in Scripture, if you do not believe in Scripture, how can you believe in one risen from the dead? We know how true this is from history. We know how true this is. The resurrection did not move the Pharisees. It didn't move a whole lot of folks. The man who spoke these very words was soon to die and then was to prove the victor over death. Raised up by the Father's power and even then still many did not believe. Still today many do not believe. How important is it that we open our hearts and our minds uh, up to the word of God? Let us together listen to his call of discipleship and reject all these games that we, we sometimes play at the expense of others. 
And instead of playing those games, let us look to others as God looks at them, as beloved children, as people worth dying for, as someone with significance. Now, like many other uh, the parables, uh, in one way or another, Luke recorded these words of Jesus with an eye right at those folks who didn't believe, <laughs> uh, namely the Pharisees. You see, in the early church, the Pharisees were seen as the rich, Why this new group of folks who eventually became called Christians, they were poor. The Pharisees who became, uh, they were pretty much the leaders already, but definitely became the leaders of, uh, the, uh, of the Jewish faith after the destruction of the temple. Uh, they, they threw out all the Jewish Christians. They threw them out from the synagogues there in the, in the first century. So isolated from their own people, the Jewish Christians, they stood alone religiously. And hated by all the Jews, by the general population at least, they were isolated uh, business-wise as well. So indeed, they were, they were very poor. <laughs> These Jewish Christians would love to live off the scraps of those who had more than enough. And at the same time, these words that Luke wrote about here and, and these words of Jesus uh, had an eye toward uh, some great irony. The, the question that we read here towards the end, that's implied at least, you know, if you don't believe in Scripture, how are you going to believe someone uh, from the dead? That was a direct challenge to the Pharisees. You see, for the Christian, for us, those who are followers of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus is the ultimate revelation, one to which all Scripture is pointed to. You see, in, in the Christian mind, uh, the faith in, in, in the Christian Bible, everything would be bankrupt. We would be bankrupt if it wasn't for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There would almost be no point of coming. I mean, there really would not be any point. Now, over the last 2,000 years, uh, the demographics, culture, and, and politics, and everything else has changed quite a bit. Today, uh, very roughly, um, there are 2.2 billion Christians in the world. Versus the 13 to 14 million Jews or so. Now the tables have definitely turned. So too has the meaning of this parable. Because we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, those who profess to, to uh, have Jesus in our hearts, to, to live the life that he lived, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to each other. We have a responsibility uh, to those that we meet and those in our community and those are all around the world, especially those who have very little or nothing at all. We are called to serve the poor as individuals <laughs> and as a whole. Now, don't get mad. <laughs> don't get mad at me for saying that. I mean, it's here in the Bible. They were called to serve and called to give. We need to be reminded often of our, of our Christian roots because we who enjoy many, many blessings, we were once the, the poor outcast. We were the once the ones on the outside. And to ignore this heritage and to act as if the poor don't exist, much like this rich man in the parable did, it's, it becomes a very serious matter. It becomes a serious matter. When we serve others, when we serve others, do we act as if we are doing them a favor? Is it something that what we do to make them make us feel better at least? When I was in seminary, I, we lived in Springfield, Ohio, and I had to go into Dayton um, all, every, for every class. And so I had about a 40, 45 minute drive uh, in. And right before the seminary, there was this intersection that I would come to every time. And just about every time, this same man was there selling these uh, uh, little bitty flowers for a donation. And, uh, you know, if you judge a book by its cover, uh, you know, he was, he, was, he was needing the money. He was on part of the homeless, I think, and, you know, uh, this looked very, very rough. And for, for, for a long time, uh, I, I'm ashamed to say I, I did what, I did some, something, I don't know, I'm sure none of us will do this, but, you know, as you come up and someone's right there with a sign needing help or, 
you know, trying to sell something to raise a dollar or two, you know, we're like, oh, wow, look over there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's green. And I would do that almost for three years. Uh, every day I went up there, you know, it's like, oh, there he is. Uh, oh, good, there's someone in front of me. <laughs> oh, good, I'll just look over here for a little while. And one day I thought, well, I'm going to be a good Christian. And I bought a flower. I rolled my window down, and he just came over and handed me a flower that was halfway wilted already. But, and, you know, I drove away, and I, I remember feeling so good about myself. I finally stopped after all these years <laughs> of passing him by. And I thought about him often. And I thought about my attitude. And especially as we think about that question, are we, when we serve others, are we, are we really serving them or are we trying to make ourselves feel good? Are we trying to make ourselves look good? Do we realize their presence, their presence is an invitation to be in intimacy with God, to have that love of God flowing in and through us, so who are the poor? Most of the time we would connect the poor with those uh, who might lack something that we don't have. But let us look again at this parable. The poor, um, the poor are the disdained, the hated, those that we want to keep at an arm's length. Those who uh, not only lack goods, you know, they might be dis uh, distasteful to, to, uh, to our way of life. But there are others who lack that we want, might want to keep it away from ourselves and away from our families as well. They're simply just not like us. <laughs> they don't dress like us. They don't act like us. They might even be our enemies. They might even be our enemies. At what point do we show them compassion? At what point do we show them the love of Christ? Even small gestures, as we saw in a video just a few moments ago, of, you know, it's just a hug. It's just a smile. It's just, a, you know, some spare change. Even small gestures remind us of the pain of others. To offer someone food uh, that's very hungry. To, to pay for someone and you will never get a word of thanks for it. You know, like, a, you know, the random acts of kindness that someone behind you in a fast food line. To volunteer at different organizations. To talk with hungry people and, and to actually treat them with dignity. This helps us to feel their feelings. Without it, without that, we can just pass them by. Just like poor Lazarus. Sat there his whole life and everyone passed him by. The dogs were kinder to Lazarus than his own people. We do not need anyone back from the dead to remind us of what we need to be about because we have Jesus. <laughs> we have Jesus who died our death, rose again for new life. And we literally have the poor right outside our doors. Oftentimes we see them set up in the bushes. The voice of the poor, they're calling for help. They're calling for help here and everywhere. And when they cry out, it is the cry of Jesus in the world. In these tragic times, in these times where it's so, we can't even turn the TV on or read the newspaper or hear the news about uh, without something bad happening. When we are tempted to cry out for vengeance, let us remember we are called to love. We are called to have compassion. We are called to share that light of Christ. Before our, our hymn, I, I wanted to, to sing this morning, and I don't think I can, but I'm going to ask all of you to, um, uh, to sing that chorus, Fill My Cup, Lord, because we cannot go out and to serve without being filled ourselves. And so let this be a prayer uh, just right now, and then we'll have some time here at the altar. It's number 641. It's just a little chorus uh, in your hymnal. You may know it, uh, but please uh, let us join in together and just sing in this chorus once time, one time through here. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord, come and quench the 
this thirsting of my soul, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. Gracious God, as we gather to worship you today, this is our prayer that you do fill our cup. Lord, if there's someone here that's needing your touch, we just pray that during this, this hymn of thanksgiving, Lord, that they will receive what you have to give them, that all of us will be able to receive what you have to give us so that we can go out into this world to share your love, to tell others of your good news. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that you use this time in Jesus' name. Amen.